Hi everyone, Shelly here. So I thought I would share with you my process for painting a small face. By small, I mean two inches from chin to the base of the hat you see here in the video. So I'm typically much happier when I get to paint at the minimum five, six inch uh, size faces. I mean, really, truly, I love painting larger than life heads, but it's not always practical. So I think as a well-rounded professional artist, you should be able to paint a two inch head as well as a 12 inch head. So here we go. Um, this canvas, it's a wood panel that I'm working on that's been oil primed. It's 30 inches by 37 inches tall. So it's a full figure. I mean, this uh, cowgirl you see here, she's actually sitting on a horse who's kind of trampling through the water. She's crossing the Cheyenne River, which is in South Dakota. I was at this really cool Western photo shoot there for Fiddler's Green Productions. And that's where I um, met this beautiful model that you see here. Her name's Jordan. And she was uh, really a true cowgirl in spirit and in life. So it, it really worked super well to have her there uh, during the photo shoot. So if you didn't see part one, uh, you may want to go back over there and check that video out. It's just a really quick video. It shows you my palette and how I mixed my initial uh, flesh tones to get started. Following that is part two, which shows you very quickly the painting of the hat. Cause I like to start at the top and then work my way down. Well, actually I started with the background, <laughs> let that dry and then worked my way down from the hat. The tough part of this painting is her entire face is in shadow. The light source is the sun and it is behind her. You can see the bright highlight to the left of the head. You can see how bright that left shoulder is and the left side of the hat compared to the right shoulder and the right side of the hat where the shadow is falling. So I have to treat it where there's some contrast so you can understand, you know, that the features are set in their proper way, you know, with the eyes sunken into the skull a little bit, but still yet there's not a lot of contrast. So it's something that can be tricky. I am trying to work that out as I go, following the reference pretty closely, but in a more painterly, um, style. I think the colors match pretty closely to what I see here in the photo reference. Now what you didn't see was before I started any of this painting on the large wood panel, I actually did a color study in two parts. I did one part where I just kind of focused on figuring out which paint colors I wanted to use. So I tested a couple of different reds, a couple of different greens, because I knew predominantly that the color harmony for this overall portrait is going to be green and red with the little tiniest touches of blue. <laughs> so that's my color harmony. And then I just needed to figure out which red, which green, which blue, those kinds of things. And the color study was very helpful. So basically I did the color swatches. And then once I had the swatches figured out, I actually painted a small, probably eight by 10 color study next to the color swatches, made some notes. So I have that here by my easel while I'm working, just in case I need to refer back to anything that I kind of figured out in that color study. Do I normally do color studies? No, not typically, but because this was kind of challenging as far as, like I said, the face being pretty much in full shadow, I just wanted to kind of get into it a little bit before I was on the actual canvas, especially since it's only a two inch head. Now, probably I could have painted the head large to practice figuring out some of this colors, but I think the small study did, did its job. So I was ready to move on. I, I find <laughs> I don't often do color studies and, and color charts and things like that for a specific painting because I get bored easily. Once I've figured everything out, it's like, okay, I've figured it out. I've gotten through the hurdles and the hard parts. So I'm ready to paint something new now and figure its challenges and hurdles out. 
I think that's the big part of why I love painting is, is figuring out, you know, the problems and working my way through them. But that's crazy because, you know, when you're in the actual painting itself, new problems will come up that you didn't even find initially in the color study. So it's continuously a learning process and by no means am I bored while I'm <laughs> painting this very large, very cool cowgirl. One of the things that happens with a small face like this, remember it's two inches tall, uh, you can't put in a lot of detail. There's just no room for it. And really, you've heard people maybe say this in the past, you know, when you're looking at a yearbook photo, they're very tiny. Um, you're really able to make out the likeness of someone you know in a, such a tiny situation because of the shadow shapes, the shadow patterns in their face. It, somehow tells our brain that yeah this is mary or this is bill or whoever <laughs> and it's the kind of the same thing if you're walking down the street and your friend is you know a block away you can tell who it is sometimes by the shadow shapes on their face sometimes by their mannerisms but it's really those shadow shapes that help and when you're working this tiny you know there's there's just no need for all that detail now if there's a strong shadow pattern that helps in this situation <laughs> i did not give myself a strong shadow pattern so i'm going to have to make sure that any degree of contrast that i can pull out without overdoing it uh, will help especially placing the features spot on i can't let my features be off not even one millimeter not even a hair. They have to be really correct. So I'm going to be, you know, putting, you have to put paint down in order to see what needs to be corrected. So I start with the top getting right into the eyes and then I start adjusting the lights and the contrast and I kind of go up and back with little tiny hair-like sized uh, adjustments, especially through the eyes but you can't really get caught up in too much detail. I mean, I'm using the smallest brushes. They're like zero to four, I think was the biggest brush I got to use in the face. And also putting down the darks in the hair helped me to really understand the tone, the, you know, the lights versus that dark mass of hair so that I didn't end up going too light because I don't want this to read as light is hitting that front part of her face. I really want it to show up as shadow. And I think that's going to come down to um, that light hitting the jawline there on this. It's, it's the left picture plane. It's the left side of her face in the picture plane. Uh, by really making sure that I have that contrast, the bright light that's shining onto it, but it's also shining onto it, not directly. It's actually hitting it parallel, which would mean it's actually more of a half tone, but I need for that half tone to read almost as if it's being hit by direct sunlight. I think we'll see when we get there to really make you understand the viewer understand that her front face is in shadow. So you, it's not that I'm painting detail when you see me continuously working on the eyes like this. I mean, I spent a lot of time working on the eyes. It's just making those shifts, those millimeter-like tiny shifts to nail the placement of the eyes. And it's a three-quarter view, which can be tricky. So you just wanna make sure that you know you have the angle correct and as I'm looking at the reference, I think you saw this in my initial setup, if it was either in part one or part two, how I have, I have two computer monitors next to my easel. One shows me the actual two inch size face, just in case I need to go in and check something with my proportion tool. And that way it's just one-to-one -one measuring. I, I understand that what I see there on that second computer screen is exactly the same size as what I'm painting on the canvas. Then on the other computer monitor, <laughs> I also have the same face and it's really large zoomed in. Not that I need to see it for the detail, but just 
to really help me focus. I think sometimes when I'm painting small, if I can see the detail on the computer monitor of let's say an eye, not that I'm gonna paint exactly what I see in the computer, I don't know, I feel like I can just kind of squint at it and then paint what I see just slightly from the squint, if that makes any sense. But I can't really see it on the other computer monitor when it's very small and two inch, like I can't squint at it and kind of simplify it down into you know basic shapes but when it's large on the computer monitor I can do that so that's just something quirky about me and how I look at the reference but I felt like in the end it led me to where I wanted to be as far as the look of the face one thing I did while I was painting in the background was I let some of that blue sky overlap onto the edge of the face from the underpainting. And then here you see me still making some face shape adjustments because uh, the angle of the side of the face is very important also in capturing a likeness. Not that I need this to be a portrait of Jordan. It doesn't have to really capture her exact likeness, but I'm still kind of aiming towards that because I like the look of her. I think it really, uh, her personality exuded exactly the attitude that I wanted this cowgirl to have. So I'm just really following the shape of her head and the placement of her features very closely, which should lend me in the end, you know, guide me to her likeness. So that's just a bonus. The other thing that happens with outdoor lighting in this situation where you have some strong sunlight and then there's some cast shadows like on the front of her face, the color temperatures that I'm using in the shadow zone are going to read as more of a cool color compared to the light colors which are going to read as more warm mainly because the light source is the sun and the sun is a warm light. So that's another way to help your viewer understand that the front of the face because it's being painted in these cool flesh tones is in the shadow and the warmth that you see in the highlights depending on if it's direct or if it's more of a half tone will tell the viewer you know that there's plane changes happening and that the light's hitting that bright area I'm working in the selective start manner and basically I selected the forehead as my feature to start with. But the key to painting in the selective start manner is to finish an area or a zone before you move on. You're basically, you're not painting on the forehead and then painting on the chin and then painting on the nose and then going back to the eye. You're finishing one area and then moving on. And, you know continuing basically each brush stroke you put down is connected to the previous brush stroke that was laid down prior to it and the other thing that I'm focusing on is not over blending I'm trying to really keep my brush strokes fresh I want to just put them down and leave them uh, I'll maybe add another brush stroke on top of that last brush stroke if I didn't like the color or if it I didn't like the uh, value of that color that's how I will change it. I uh, just continuously am layering paint, but I'm really not blending it in. I'm just putting down the brush strokes and letting them stand. Here you see I've got my proportion tool and I'm checking to see that the bottom of the nose is stopping. Now I have, remember, the monitor where the face is its exact same size on the monitor as on the computer and that's where I'm checking the measurement from and I check the length and the stopping point of the base of the nose because I know from experience that I tend to draw in my noses way too long so <laughs> if you're like me and you know this about yourself then it's always a good idea to measure it either one-to-one -one like you see me doing here with the proportion tool or however you do your measuring but definitely measure I mean, you could do comparative measuring where you check it perhaps from maybe the tear duct of the eye on the left and then to the bottom of the nose. And you can see if uh, what you're measuring out is correct because you don't want that nose to come down too far. 
light is bouncing up from her chin and probably a little bit from her clothing onto the bottom plane of the nose. Normally you see the bottom plane of the nose in more shadow than the, say the tip of the ball of the nose, but in this case it's not. So I have to balance that light under the nose compared to the base or bridge of the nose. It has to be a little bit lighter with some maybe little highlights around the nostrils, which is what I see in the reference image. Maybe you guys have heard that there's three color zones of the face. Normally the forehead is in the yellow zone while the middle of the face, the cheeks across the nose is the pink or red zone. And then the chin and mouth area, that's typically the gray zone, which in men can be a green gray, women can be more of a pink gray, but it's grayer or less saturated because it's further away from light and it's kind of turning under as if you know maybe you see an egg that's sitting vertically and the light source is top left as you move down the to the bottom of the egg it's further away from the light and getting a little bit grayer so that's where those three zones of the face come in so that's another thing that i'm thinking about now as i move down towards her mouth and chin that area is definitely going to be a little bit grayer not only because of the light setup, but also because the reflection, she's wearing a green shirt and she has a blue bandana around her neck. Some of those green and blue colors are going to be reflecting back up onto her chin area. That's something to constantly think about when you're working with color, especially in flesh tones. What are your background colors? What are your clothing colors? Anything that's close to an area of flesh is going to be affected by what is near it. So, and then also the color of any light source that's coming in can play with affecting the color temperature in the flesh as well. So flesh is, you know, one thing, but it's always going to be affected by what's happening around it. So you have to constantly remind yourself, you know, I'm not just painting flesh in a vacuum. There's other things that are coming into play. As I have been painting throughout the years, I have constantly kind of been looking for my style. Am I more painterly? Am I more impressionistic? Am I more realistic or hyper-realistic painter? And I'm trying to balance between a high level of realism and painterly. I want it to look extremely realistic from a distance, maybe three feet, four feet back from the canvas. And then as you look closely, I want it to have interesting marks, interest, interesting brush strokes, uh, so that it gives the viewer something to be excited to see, you know, when you can get close enough, because if you maybe take a sample of one area of the face, it could stand on its own if you blew it up, let's say, as an uh, abstract, uh, impressionistic style painting. But then when you come out and zoom away, you know, it becomes a face. So I always find that balance between realism and abstraction or impressionism, uh, you know, something that I'm striving for. Now you saw the fan brush come into play there that is knocking down some of the glare. So, um, you know, like I said, I'm not blending my brush strokes. I want them to stand and remain fresh. So uh, sometimes the brush strokes can catch the light while I'm working and I just knock them down. I mean, it's just the whisper of a touch with that fan brush, nothing too uh, heavy uh, handed there. So here we're getting into that gray zone that I was referring to before. I uh, started out fairly dark. I laid down those first brush strokes and I realized it was probably a little too dark in value. So I put in some lighter values, but still staying within that gray family. The brushes that I'm using are not extremely stiff. They're nowhere near as stiff as say hog's hair. Um, they're almost like a sable. They're not quite that soft, but close. 
and I think having a softer brush like that when you're working in this manner of laying down a lot of layers of paint really one on top of the other wet into wet these softer brushes lend themselves to you know letting the paint just glide on top one layer on top of the other Here's another thing you may have heard along your painting journey. Um, where does color happen? The most saturated color happens just before you turn into a new plane. So let's say a light plane is coming up next to a shadow plane. The area where the light plane and the shadow plane meet is where color happens. So the most saturated color here on this chin is happening just as it's turning under and moving closer to that shadow on the neck. So you can often put in some areas of saturation in the chin zone there. And that's gonna happen on any turning plane of the face. A lot of times you'll see that along the side plane where the cheek kind of turns away from the light and then the side plane of the face becomes shadow you'll get that sometimes people refer to it as the terminator line and that's where saturated color will happen the degree of saturation of course is up to you the artist i'm painting in this mouth in a very loose manner i just wanted to get some of that gray flesh tone down and i'm going to just suggest a shape for the mouth and then i'm going to start to carve around it i'm going to almost approach it like a sculptor would where you kind of have this block of marble and then you start sculpting into it and find the feature that you're working on it's kind of the same principle so you know you get something down to work with initially and then you just continuously you know make adjustments and find the mouth that you want many master painters I've come across have suggested that mouths especially need to be painted in as few brush strokes as possible. You want to get it down and don't worry about, you know, you don't want it to look outlined. I find that trying to paint with line in the mouth zone is never really a good idea. Even if you're going for hyper realism, you don't necessarily want to go in with you know the thought process of laying in lines you want to be thinking more in mass even though the masses are thin sometimes or small and you just want to find the shape and it put it down in its correct color value and then you can make adjustments but for the most part you want to not think about mouth in the way of you know a line drawing also with the mouth you don't want to stop right at the edge of the lips you want to let the flesh tone from the muzzle or the chin kind of work its way over the edge of the lips that way the edges are soft or blurred or broken you don't want hard edges especially on the upper or bottom lip as it's coming close to the corner when it gets into the corner yeah there's probably going to be a little bit more of some hard edges but for the most part if you think about it the mouth as it stands alone perhaps what if you were painting just the mouth you would think of it as a full portrait where you want a variety of edges so that's kind of the thought process in my mind when i'm painting the mouth i want to have some hard edges but very few mostly soft broken or blurred edges the other thing to remind myself of while i'm painting this mouth is she's a cowgirl she's not living the life where she's putting on lipstick to go out and get her day done i want to really make sure that whatever flesh colors i'm using reads as lips but not as lips with lipstick on it so that's the other thing i'm thinking about with the mouth i'm constantly trying to build form and volume i don't want the mouth to appear like it's a flat zone it's very much a mound of flesh initially you could even paint it that way 
paint the lower chin to bottom of the nose area as a rounded mound first, then go ahead and put in some lip color and then start sculpting out the shape of the mouth. That way you are gonna hopefully avoid any sort of flatness that can happen. I see beginning portrait painters, when they do mouths, they're, they're not seeing it as the full voluminous thing that it is. Um, there's even little pockets of flesh, you know, near the corners of the mouth, the muzzle that's above the bottom, I'm sorry, that's above the top lip is uh, not only rounded, but it can have that indention, you know, where the cupid's bow is right below the center of the nose. So yes, it's round, there's a mound of flesh, but then there's little dents and divots in that mound that make up our mouth area. And I've, I like having that challenge where I can find those little voluminous shapes and you know, then you can see it in the painting in the end. Now we are about 26 minutes into this painting for the video. What you don't see is I have taken out in the editing process the time away from the canvas. I didn't want this to be a two hour video for you to watch just to see the painting of this tiny two inch face. So those little moments have been taken out. I paint really slowly, truly. You wouldn't think a two inch face would take more than maybe 30 minutes, an hour to paint, but it did take probably, mm, I'd say two hours for me to complete this from the top of the hat to the bottom of the chin. I forget exactly, but yeah, I think it was two hours, definitely no more than three. But so the video is only like 54 minutes long in total. So I wanted to make sure you realize I'm not making the color decisions between brush strokes as quick as what it appears in the video. I'm definitely taking my time and sometimes I will hover my brush over an area before I lay the brush stroke down and, and sort of see if that color is matching that area and it's the right value for that spot before I place the brush stroke down. You'll notice there's some green around her eye and then there's some green around the chin. The reason I'm choosing green for these sort of half tone, eh, there, there's somewhat of a shadow uh, situation there, but the green is going to mix a little bit with the pink and become a little grayer. So it will turn into more of a neutral zone color. Uh, these are oil paints, so they'll sink and shift the tiniest bit as they uh, are laying there on the canvas. But I'll probably put another brush stroke of pink or mix some pink into the green and you know tone down that green up by that eye on the left before it's all over to get it a little less green. But the reason it's green, I wanted you to know, was because it's the complementary color to red, which is the base color of her flesh. And that's gonna make for really nice um, half-tone, slight shadow zones in those areas. One of the things that's going to help this tiny face read as you know, have a more realistic look to it is the degree of the transitions that are happening from one plane to the next and how many transitional steps that I take to get to the new plane. And I find, you know, initially I'll go in and keep those transitions pretty simple. And then one of the things I do is I continue to sort of work over the the face, let's say, on the second layer, even though it's still wet into wet during the first painting phase, I kind of complete the entire face and then I revisit areas. And, and the reason for that revisit is to improve upon those transitions. I believe the more transitional steps that you can have from one plane to the next gives you a higher degree of realism.
one of the things I have to keep telling myself is I, I don't want the eyelashes and the pupils in her eyes to be definitely not black, but the darkest value, I don't even want them to be as dark as maybe that darkest part of her braid. I want them to read as pretty light. Otherwise, it's going to look like she's got makeup on. Like I said, she's a real cowgirl. She's not putting on <laughs> some mascara and lipstick to uh, go out and wrangle up her cattle for the day. Just not happening. So I have to be careful and really manage the contrast in these areas where there tends to be a high degree of contrast, such as the eyes. So the angle that you see on the screen uh, is a little bit off from my reference image and that's due to the camera angle that I am recording the video from. It's hard to paint and have a camera over your shoulder exactly in front of your canvas. Otherwise, all you're going to see is the back of my big head. That's never a good video. <laughs> Another area that I have to be careful with the edges is where the face meets the hair and the braid. I want to make sure those areas remain somewhat soft or and or broken. Now may be a good time to mention if you've stayed in my video this long, you might be a true fan. And if you want to work a little more closely with me, I do offer some mentoring and one on one coaching. You can learn more about those programs at sjcportraitcourse.com. Now you can see that I'm going into that gray area under her eye here and just toning it down a little bit with some of the pinks that are surrounding it and it will work beautifully to just sort of neutralize it and make it less green but still keep the value that makes it read as somewhat of a shadow zone within the shadow of the face. The other thing that's happening in the flesh here, especially on this lighter part of the lower jawline, the hat color is going to be reflecting into that area, as well as some of the uh, green from her shirt. There's a little blue from the scarf as well. Since the majority of the face is laid in now, I can go back and make some adjustments on contrast maybe help deepen and push some of the volume within the face. Here you can see I am furthering the transitional steps from this outer corner getting closer to the iris. I'm going to go through the face and restate some of the highlights and some of the transitions. Here I'm really making sure that that underplane of the nose is reflecting some of the light from down below and not really in full shadow as we discussed before. And here I'm just pulling some of the darker tones right up on the edge of that hat, that underplane, because the hat's casting quite a lot of shadow directly onto that section of the eyebrow and the orbital area of that eye on the left. And then here there's a little bit of a highlight zone along the outer edge of the face on this right side. And I want to make sure that I can really see that even from a distance. So when I stand back, it wasn't really reading as clearly as a little um, lit edge. So I'm going through and restating it. Here I'm bringing in a little more darker reddish brown tone for this um, eyelid crease 
I don't want there to be a high degree of contrast, but I still want to push some of the areas that are a little more darker than the surrounding flesh just to really build the form. I want to have a lot of good volume, but still uh, managing the degree of contrast that's happening. I'm going to put in some of the dark underneath the chin. This is really going to help me to see better if my values for this lower part of the face, uh, these flesh tones need to be the right value and the right temperature. And in order for me to really be able to judge that, I need to have some of these darker notes in place. In this part, I'm going to speed things up just a little bit. Uh, I didn't want to have you sit through the full regular speed of getting some of these darker notes in and even a little bit of the neck. So here I want to turn off my brain. I don't want my brain to be saying, yes, you're painting a neck. Yes, you're painting a shirt. I want it to just let my eyes do the work. Brain, be quiet. Eyes do the work. Just paint the shapes and put them in the right spot. Put them down in the right color temperature and in the right color value and all will be well. <laughs> After standing back and thinking for a moment, I realized that I still needed to push some of the darker value in the flesh here, just below the hat at the top of the nose where it kind of joins at the glabella, which is that area between the eyebrows. So I'm going to just speed up a little bit more of the video just to show you these are some final touches, just going back over the face and adding any areas that need a little bit more love. So when do you know it's finished? So I like to stand back and look at the painting from a little bit of a distance. And if I see nothing more that I can do, Nothing's jumping out and saying, mm, this area might need a little more work. Uh, this area might need a color temperature adjustment. If nothing is popping out at me and everything looks good from the distance, then that may signal that it's finished. Now, <laughs> just because you get to that point and you think in your mind, okay, it's finished. You've worked on it for several hours that day, perhaps, and now you go to bed and you come back the next morning. Then you maybe have a cup of coffee, you sit down, you don't look at the reference. You just sit quietly, maybe a little nice music, and you look at your painting. Then if something does not jump out, Maybe you've given it 10, 15 minutes of a good, just living with it, you know, sitting with it, feeling, you know, that it's okay. <laughs> and nothing jumps out at you. There's nothing more that needs to be done. Then it's finished. <laughs> I can never say it's finished on the, the same day where I've spent a lot of time working on it. I know this from experience because Every time I do that, I'm like, okay, it's definitely done. And then I go to bed and I wake up the next day and I do what I said. I sit and I stare at it. No reference involved, just the painting on its own, its own merit as a painting. 
always the next morning, something jumps out at me. <laughs> so just from experience, I know this is a good thing to do. And then you can say it's finished. More often than not, I don't find anything the next morning, say the second or third day, and you come back and look at it. Usually I've taken care of it in that, that next morning's uh, painting session. And then I also know this from experience because I do have paintings that hang in my house that I painted years ago. And <laughs> you can live with them for many years. And then as your skills improve or your taste change or you develop your eye a little bit further, then <laughs> things may pop out at you years later that you want to change. But uh, you wouldn't have seen those at that stage when you were working on the painting. I've actually come into a painting uh, much later, many years later, taken it down off the wall, sanded the face off and repainted the whole thing because my skills had improved to such a degree. And I really liked that painting, so I wanted to save it. And that was something that happened a few years back. Um, I think there may even be a video on that one, but I digress. <laughs> so she's coming up to being pretty close to finish. Remember this was a definite uh, switch from my larger faces that I'm typically used to painting. Um, I felt like the two inch face did come to a full finish that I was happy with. And I think the next day, the only thing that I adjusted was that little light shape that's right below the eyebrow on that right eye, the eye on the right. I ended up making that just a tiny bit darker and you'll see that um, coming up now as we flip over into the final finished face painting and I promise you I am not touching anything else on it. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, the finished version of her. Uh, thanks for watching guys and I hope to see you in the next video.